one of the greatest photographers of this century. He would have been Degas. It's the inner feelings that he could bring out in a picture. There are some people who capitalize upon shams. And that's the greatness. That's the difference. It came along exactly when we needed it. I think about Nat, and it reminds me that I need to be like that. He just had a, um, a talent for a living. I guess I'm lucky in a way. God, what else can I say? with these trees. I met Nat Fine for the first time in the summer of 1991. I'll get on my knees and get, get down like this and make a shot like that. I was producing and hosting a magazine program for the local cable company. The show featured people and places of note within our coverage area, Rockland County, New York. Nat had lived in this modest house in Tapan, New York for over 40 years. At the time, he was exhibiting a few of his photographs at the Main Street Art Center, a small gallery in nearby Nyack. I'm glad you haven't got a split image. Since he was a Pulitzer Prize winner in photography and lived locally, he was a perfect subject for our program. This is nice. Having a strong interest in photography, a love of sports, and the New York Yankees, I knew of Nat's iconic image of Babe Ruth. Taken at Ruth's retirement in 1948, it won the 1949 Pulitzer Prize for Outstanding News Photography. The Bay Bows Out has a legendary history almost as unique as its famous subject. It stands as the first sports-themed photo to win the Pulitzer. Virtually any book that features the history of the Pulitzer Prize-winning photographs will have that picture somewhere on its cover. When most people think of Babe Ruth, they think of that photograph more than any other image, along with Joe Rosenthal's incomparable image of Iwo Jima and few others. It has become part of America's mythology. What I was not aware of was Nat's incredible legacy as an artist and as a human being. In a career as a photojournalist that spanned over six decades, he never stopped making photographs. His passion for his craft has left us with thousands of incredible photos, creating a visual document of the history of everyday life in New York City that is quite possibly unparalleled. This is a lovely day. What a wonderful 4th of July to be with you and your family. He plays a He also left a legacy of a life well lived. Touching everyone he met with his extraordinary talent his talent for photography, his talent for singing, his talent for drawing, and most of all, his talent for living. I guess I want to be a comedian, really. That's about it. Nat was born August 7, 1914, on New York's Lower East Side to Jewish immigrants Francis and Hyman Fine. He was an only child. His mother worked as a seamstress, and his father was a singer who toured with Irving Berlin. Both would play key roles in Nat's development as an artist and a person. Nat grew up with Irving Berlin playing piano, his father singing, and many times, you know, uh, Nat would join in. That vaudevillian background, I, th I think, helped him in his pictures because it gave him a sense of timing and how he relaxed his subjects. He knew exactly when to say a joke, when to shut up, what to say to disarm somebody and, and, and relax them. And that, I think, was all part of his, of his timing, which was part of his talent. While it sounds idyllic, and music and singing would always be a large part of his life, his youth would be affected by his father's touring lifestyle in ways that were not always positive. His mother, Frances, struggled to work and raise Nat virtually alone. But his father was forgetful, let's say. He would forget he was around, <laughs> not come home, do this and that. 
go on the road, leaving him. There were times when he didn't have anything to eat and the baker would give him a, you know, a loaf of bread. Or he didn't have a place to sleep and the uh, deli guy would let him sleep in the back room. Something in him was a survivor. <laughs> it really was. And it wasn't a uh, mean survivor at all. It was a empathetic <laughs> survivor who could see good in, in everything. It was this empathy, this ability to see the good in all things that would shape Nat's life and career. He began his professional life in 1932, working as a copy boy for his first newspaper, The Journal American. A year later, 1933, he joined the legendary New York Herald Tribune, also as a copy boy. Nat broke into the newspaper business by being a copy boy and was always fascinated with the uh, photographers. And that was kind of a way for him to step up and make a little more money, especially during the Depression. I think at the time Nat started the paper, he's making $10.79 a week. The Trib, as the New York Herald Tribune would come to be called, was a merger between two of New York's greatest newspapers, James Gordon Bennett's New York Herald and Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. Established in 1924, it was the conservative counterpoint to the more liberal-leaning New York Times. With a list of staffers and contributors from Karl Marx to Tom Wolfe, it provided the perfect atmosphere for a budding talent like Nat to flourish. They were the people who thought, wrote, and did things in the most artistic of ways uh, among the newspapers. Where the Daily News would have everything would be right in your face type of picture. And the Times the Tribune didn't have to work that way. And they were looking for a picture that was more, I hate to say artistic, but uh, a little more uh, photographic, a little more uh, interesting visually than just a sheer capture of a murder scene or a sporting event. We tried to have people that really made a mark when they, whether it was writing a story or taking a picture. With its reputation for artistic excellence, the Trib was not about to hire some rookie copy boy as a staff photographer. That would have to be earned. And in his unique style, that's exactly what Nat did. In order to be a newspaper photographer, you needed to uh, know how to develop. So from time to time, young Nat used to be known to break into the photo department over in the Trib. I couldn't get in the dark room because they lock it, but I had a friend who was a retouch artist opened the locks for me. He could open anything. And I got in there and my boss caught me in there. And one of the photographers complained he's in the dark room. So they told me to keep out. And Crandall threatened to uh, fire him. And it was very serious. He was very angry with him. And somehow the other photographer said, look, let the kid, you know, the kid's just trying to learn. He's just trying to break in. I said to him, how am I going to learn to be a photographer if they kick me out all the time? So my friend kept opening the lock, and they got used to me there. Dick Crandall, the, the, his, uh, the boss of the photo department, warmed up to Nat, and then eventually gave him a job. Now he had an opportunity to be a photojournalist, but he had no camera. His mother, who was a seamstress, and you know, during hungry times, she had to get a, a loan code signed by three different people to buy this camera, which ultimately won Nat the Pulitzer. Thus began a career that would last until the paper folded in 1966. In the 33 years that Nat worked for the Trib, he made thousands of photos capturing the history and feel of the city like few others. He won more awards than any other photographer of his era. To view a Nat Fine photo is to be transported to a time in New York that no longer exists. We'll have Manhattan, the Bronx and Staten Island too. It's lovely going through the zoo. Nat Fine can enlighten people about uh, what New York was like. And the photographs 
that Nat and so many other photographers captured uh, really, really did chronicle that era. And throw, and tell me what street compares with Mott Street in July. Sweet push carts gently glide. He did chronicle the century like as, as well as any one person you can think of. I mean, these photographs of people in the, in the s snow in front of the plaza, and it was the New York that we knew, the New York that we loved. I mean, today it's greatly disrupted and changed. He was a his historian. He was New York's eye on, on history unfolding in, in the mid 20th century when America was at its peak, some would say, I would guess. We'll go to Coney need baloney on a road in Central Park we'll stroll where our first kiss we stole soul to soul and my fair lady is a terrific show they say we both may see it close someday the city Glamour can never spoil the dreams of a boy and girl. We'll turn Manhattan into an Isle of Joy.